Hey guys, I'm Nick and uh, I'm really excited for today's video because that's the effect that bring me to Houdini and it's looking very similar to Simon's Hall models uh, recursive extrusions and then, then he morphed these shapes and uh, yeah, just, just let me show you what we will be doing today. And Simon Holmiddell and uh, Man Was Machine in general brought me to procedural design and, and more of the abstract uh, design. And uh, let me know in the comments uh, what artist inspired you to learn Houdini and maybe inspired you to learn more about particular style of design. So this effect and basically the, the algorithm, the wax code that is used in this project I found it on Oddforce forums and it's written by the uh, guy whose username is Step by Step VFX. So this is more of a explanation and, and the breakdown and uh, I'm not a Houdini expert and there's this part of Wex that, to be honest, I don't fully understand how it's made, but uh, the result is so beautiful, I just want to share it with you. So you can achieve something similar. And if you will be creating your animation or still render based on this tutorial, please send me what you come up with. And next Thursday, where it will be next tutorial, I will show these works here and uh, also on all of my social medias. I will talk about them, maybe give you some feedback. I will be really interested to see what you guys will create with the technique you learned today. So let's open up Houdini and take a look at this project file. To start with, just drop your regular Geo node and uh, dive into it and I will open up these nodes. So uh, don't be afraid, the algorithm behind this, uh, this effect is not that complex. Uh, there's just uh, one part with the wax, but let's just uh, walk. I, I would like yeah, to walk you through this project and explain what all of these nodes actually do. So we started with a platonic. Um, this platonic is a solid type set to icosahedron, orientation to z-axis, radius set to 5. You can set like whatever radius, it, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, after that we add a subdivide node and it's set to Houdini, Catmull, Clark. After that we do a UV unwrap. And uh, here, basically, yeah, we, we just UV and rub that stuff. And now the fun part begins. So this for each loop is just your regular for each uh, number loop. So just drop that. And uh, method should be set to fetch piece or point. And the input from your for each begin should be connected to the metadata block and the method of that block should be fetch metadata and uh, block path is pointing to your end block which is set to merge each iteration and merge each primitives so these elements are set to primitives so that's your outer block and then you need to add uh, I think it's your regular for for loop with feedback so uh, it will be uh, yeah basically a repeat so you are connecting your first begin block of your for each loop to the input or the begin block of your repeat loop and then you add a poly extrude and uh, then you connect that poly extrude to the end block so in poly extrude, we need to divide it into individual elements, and the distance is this formula. Uh, you can experiment with this 0.6 value, but essentially, just use this one, right? Also, you will need to uncheck use common limit, um, add vertex. 
spline control, just set it to here in the thickness ramp, just set it to be like lowering, like downhill, I don't know. Um, I think the values is one and for the like for first point and for the second the ending point the value is 0.2 and interpolation set to catmull rom then you plug that into repeat end and uh, in this block you should specify that number of iterations is your frame number which means basically here in the iterations just type dollar f now if i set to display for each end my computer would burn because uh, yeah i was on 50 something frame but you can see that with each frame there are more and more subdivisions and yeah obviously I can handle more than seven. Let's just try five. Right? Okay. So that's your first for each block. And let's check these time shift nodes. So what they do is basically we can get different subdivision levels by altering the frame. So we are shifting the frame that's actually frame one. Uh, here, for, for example, in the second time shift, we are altering it to be the frame number two. So you see, we have two levels of subdivision and uh, like extrusion. Here we have time shift set to be frame three and here to be frame four. And uh, that's your the first part of your setup and now let's take a look at for each the like the copy of, of this for each um, double loop if we can call it like that basically copy this one and paste like somewhere on the, on the left or on the right and the only difference between these is that in your copied poly extrude the distance is set to zero, so we are just extruding, uh, not like extruding, we are just making new edges on the geometry and it's not changing its its shape. So now, in a point wrangle, we need to set a target position attribute. So just make sure that you are connecting your let's call this as a shape extrusion and this one will be edge extrusion or just edge subdivision but yeah let's call it edge extrusion you need to set the four point wrangles and then make sure that your edge extrusion loop time shift node goes to the first input of point wrangle and uh, your like geometry or position extrusion goes into the second input of the point wrangle. So you can see it here pretty clearly that we have our time shifts. Um, by the way, when you have these edge extrusions, your time shifts should also be the same that they are for your position extrusions. So as you may see, this time shift points to frame number one and this time shift also points to frame number one. So yeah, just make sure that you plug them correctly, otherwise it wouldn't work. And now, just really be sure that here you plug these also correctly. So, the point wrangle 1 goes to the second input of the point wrangle we need to add. So yeah, just drop a point wrangle. Point wrangle number 1 goes into the second input. Point wrangle number 2 goes into the third input. Point wrangle number three goes into the fourth input and point wrangle number four goes into the first input. This is the basically the why <laughs> this setup is working, right? So again, I won't be getting into too much detail. Um, I just want you to 
check this uh, this code here. Uh, from what I understood from this project, it basically interpolates and blends between values of different uh, inputs into this wrangle because we are inputting four different configurations of this shape into the this point wrangle and then and basically understands how we should morph between the between the shapes so this is originally uh, by step by step vfx and uh, i'm not sure that i understand that but just in case you want to recreate this effect is here you can pause the video write it down try to understand it and that's it so the result of this code allows you to do such things like manipulating these values of parameters called blend steps and that's how you get the morphings done here let me show you that i have just keyframed the values of these sliders and that's how it produces this morphing effect so let's just run it and check how it looks It's pretty beautiful. So now I, you, you basically you can export um, this as an alembic and uh, render out this mesh. But what I wanted to do is just uh, to just render the edges or the splines. Uh, so what I've done, I set the ends node that basically deletes uh, the geometry itself, leaving just um, the the skeleton that the edges and close you set to unroll with new points and then that's how i get this result i also don't want uh, the lower part of this mesh because uh yeah i don't need that and it it will be like too much it will be messy it will look messy so i set a group um this group is the bounding box targeting only things that are lower than zero on y-axis. Then I deleted the points of that group, um, added normal, but yeah, basically we don't need normals for, for this element. You just need normals. Let me add them to here. You need your normals. That's without your normals. And that's with normals. So when you, if you want to export it, just yeah, make sure that normals aren't turned on here. Um, so yeah, so I have only this shape and uh, it's morphing beautifully, right? Then I just uh, exported the Alembic from frame number one to frame number 360. And then I opened that in Cinema 4D and let me show you what I did there. Now we are in Cinema 4D and I just dragged this uh, Alembic file that I just exported and uh, let me show you that's basically same stuff we seen in Houdini. Basically I added this stainless steel material from Grayscale Gorilla just made it a bit more rough and then I added a octane object tag said it to be rendered as hair uh, root thickness set to 0.5 ticked render as hair apply this material uh, let me just so that's how it looks with this material on and uh, for the animation I used just these two lights so one of them is just this top light that makes this dramatic effect uh, but we don't have any like harsh shadows and for the for a uh, thin uh, lines I found that it's it's best when you have these harsh shadows or highlights so what I did uh, I added an octane area light set a target to be our geo so it's pointing our geo all the time and then I also added a line to spline tag and um, I added a circle around our geo and the light I animated it to be rotating around and then we have these harsh highlights here and it really adds the, the depth I don't know but yeah anyways I like this effect 
And for the camera settings, um, there is a depth of field. Um, basically, you just pick your focus to be somewhere here or anywhere you want. And then in camera imager, I set the exposure to be 2.7, highlight compression a little bit, gamma, lowered the gamma, um, added some LUTs, acceleration, uh, and of course a bit of bloom, because you know when when it's th there is some sort of like I don't know space space stuff effect when you add so much bloom, but uh, yeah, just a little bit it's always good, and uh, yeah, and also it's a uh, it's a question for you guys, but if you want me to do a video about the difference between direct lighting kernel and path tracing kernel, just let me know down in the comments. Cause you know what? Right now, if I would be rendering this at half res, it would be like 30 seconds, right? And I'm rendering direct lighting max samples 1000 GI non, cause we don't need global illumination here. But if I would be rendering this with a pass tracing kernel, I'm pretty sure it would take me much longer to render. And recently I was rendering with direct lighting on one of my client projects. And uh, you know what? On pass tracing, it takes like four minutes per frame and the result is pretty noisy. And with direct lighting, and properly set direct lighting, it takes just one minute. So it's four times faster. So yeah, if you want to know more about these difference between these kernels and how to optimize your workflow, just let me know in the comments. But for this one, I just rendered a few different cameras and let's watch the final animation one more time. Alright guys, that's all for today. Thank you so much for watching this breakdown. I hope that it was helpful to you and even if there was a part of Wex, it wasn't too scary and uh, yeah. And please subscribe to my channel, leave a like to this video if you find it helpful. It really helps my channel to grow. Recently the YouTube algorithm was, was really good on me and uh, my audience is starting to grow and I'm really thankful to every one of you who is supporting this channel. I try my best to share with you valuable things that I learn. And also next Tuesday I will be releasing my Coral Pack, so hit that bell icon so you are notified about all the new videos and you don't miss it out. I'll be back soon. Bye!